just stand together and sing with us? There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from the light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. And there's a reason why we are not overtaken. And there's a reason why we sing on through the night. And there's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began 
flesh was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your endless love pouring down. Chains on the prisoner no more. Shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested and my life Displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in him. That's when death was arrested in my life. Began. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to be in your house on this Easter Sunday. Father, we just pray today that your Holy Spirit will fill this place, Lord, that every ear will hear and every heart will know that Christ has risen. Lord, we thank you for this day. And Father, we pray this church will continue to make disciples and go out into the community. Father, we just pray that we'll gather, grow, and grow in the name of Jesus. 
We love you and we praise you and we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Hold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you why he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day arise. They remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things and the eleven to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them like a fairy tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose, and he ran to the tomb, stooping, and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, and marveling at it, what had happened, and God's people said, amen. Would you turn and greet someone before you're seated? Just turn and say hello to someone near you that is near you. <clears throat> As you're being seated, Luke, Luke is amazed at the resurrection. He, like others, are not quick believers. I was in Tonhebe, Costa Rica for my first mission trip. I was a young pastor, wide-eyed. We went to a, what we call here in the United States a reservation. The last indigenous group of Costa Rica had been put on a piece of land, taken their property taken, been put on a piece of land. They wanted to build a church building, so we went there with some other churches to get a building built. It was across a ravine, uh, the property that they had been given, and they had two trees there that they drove across. They were what they call rainforest trees. They looked like uh, the big trees in California, the redwoods. So across those two trees, uh, this driver took us, and he didn't want to go because it had been raining. And so on our journey across, there was four men on one side of the truck, four men on the other. The truck slipped, and we went to the very edge. I was there at the back on the right side, and I looked down, and it was quite a ways down. I I, I, it was about a hundred feet, as you tell the story. Of course, it gets thousands of feet, but it was it was a it was enough to die. It was enough to hit the rocks and not come back. So we got across, and the driver was visibly shaken, and he began. He had tears in his eyes, and he began to tell what happened. And what I thought had happened is that the tire had come to the very edge of the tree, and the the passenger on the other side had saw the wheel go off the tree and come back on as he turned into it. And the driver said to us, I'm glad you know the Lord. And we thought about that and we pondered it that week as we ministered to people how valuable the resurrection is that if that were our last day, that because Christ rose from the dead, he would be the first person we see. While I was there, a uh, little girl was playing in what amounted to a sewer. She had a broken Barbie, and she was playing like she had went. She was going to the beach. I found out her name was Jackie, who happened to be the, the name of my our youngest daughter, Jackie. And as I watched her play with this broken Barbie in the gray sewage water coming off the church building and off the building beside of it, I began to pray for her that this would never happen again if I could do something about it, that people would have good medical care. They had no medical care. We were there with a medical team. People would have a church building to meet, that people would have their basic needs met, but most of all, they'd have the gospel. Every little girl deserves a whole Barbie, I thought. I'd, I'd left a couple of girls that had a couple hundred Barbies because of their grandparents. I'm not 
I'm not blaming their grandparents now that I'm a grandparent, I understand. So you just give them stuff and leave, and it's all right. So, but I, I left people who had a lot of Barbie dolls, and here was the person who had half a Barbie doll. So what hit me during that week is the resurrection had two values to it. One is if you die, but one is if you live. It makes your life worth something. Life has purpose and meaning if every person's going to go before God and give an account of their life and every, if every person's truly created in the image of God. And the resurrection to me began to be more real. To my shame, I'd preached about it, I'd taught about it, but there was something God did during that trip that opened my eyes and broke my heart that the resurrection's not just fire insurance when I die, but it means that I live a certain way now so that I minister to people's needs so that they can hear the gospel and know Christ. So I began to write in a journal about confidence. Now, this was 30-something years ago. And I wrote and was honest that I did not have much confidence in myself, which ended up being a good thing. But I began to write down that there's ways to be confident, and I was just 20-something years old, and I took a couple of passages I knew, and I remembered a couple of them, and I took a couple of passages out of the gospel, and I began to focus on them and say, I can be confident in Christ. I'm not, but he is. You read this story, and you see two men that had not got there yet. Their confidence has been shattered. They wanted a savior that would make Israel great and destroy the Romans and bring everything the way they wanted. And now he doesn't come as a Messiah king. I mean, how can you die on a cross, an inglorious death, and be king? They still can't put it together that he can be the Messiah king and the suffering servant, that both are the same person. And so they rode the road to Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they need confidence. Now, confidence is a sure belief. It's a sure conviction that you know what you know. Hope is tied to confidence in the Bible. Hope is a confident expectation of the future because what you know now and what you've known in the past. We don't have to go across every bridge and check out the bridges in America. Not yet. I hear some of them are pretty bad. But we don't go down the interstate and stop at every one and say, I'm going to go look at the underpinning and check it out. Why? Because we've been across hundreds or thousands of bridges. That's hope. You know you've been across a bridge before you go across the next one. But your hope or your confidence is only as good as the object in which you place your faith. Everybody say amen. It is only as good as the object in which you place your faith. You can have a great sincerity, but if the bridge is about to fall down, it doesn't matter how much you hope in it that it'll last. It won't last. That is what they're going to learn. If you boil it down, these two men and the disciples and the apostles are going to learn that they had great confidence in places, but their confidence was not in the Lord and his word in the places they needed. Luke chapter 4 on your screen is the verse that we've been going over all this series about seeing Jesus said the spirit of the Lord is upon me you see it as it comes up on here he says he's anointed me to proclaim good news the gospel means good news that God loves people who fail and he chases us and he restores us I'm going to give good news to the poor it means broke those who have nothing to give God they've come to realize there's no bargaining no trying no good works that'll do they need God himself. I've come to give freedom to the captives. This word was most often used of fish that was hooked, that had took the bait and got hooked. We call them addicts. But we're all addicts to ourselves or to something. I've come to set the addicts free, the captives. Sometimes it's anxiety. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's guilt. Sometimes it's shame. I've come to set you free, he said. I'm going to Recover the sight of the blind. Those who can see physically but can't see spiritually, can't see the value of God, and can't see the value of people made in the image of God. I've come to give freedom to the oppressed, those who are beaten down, stepped on, wronged, beaten down. And I'm going to give the Lord's favor to all those that love me. Now, the first person, I uh, saw so whoever lived that was named Mary. She had a wasting disease. Uh, she never got out of the bed before she died that I saw her. I was a young pastor again. I 
I would go to visit her to bless her, but I always got blessed by her. She radiated Christ. She blessed me over and over, and she would speak words of life and pray for me and my family and for the church. And She had such a passion for Christ. And she reminded me of 2 Corinthians 4, our body is wasting away, but inside we're growing closer to the Lord every day, day by day. She went home that way. She knew his resurrection. I, I was talking to uh, my granddaughter this week, Evelyn. She's our youngest granddaughter. And I said, you know, it's interesting that we look a lot alike. And she looked at me and she said, Papa, uh, your hair's gray and mine's brown. And uh, my belly doesn't hang over my belt. And you're a lot older than me. And I said, well, but other than that, we're just alike. And she said, no, 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 we're not. No, we're not. So I wanted to encourage her that she looked a lot like her papa, but she, she saw through that. But here's the thing. If you know Jesus Christ, the Bible says you'll become more like him every day of your life. First John 2, 6, those who say they know him will walk as he walked. These two men have been confronted on the road that they're not walking in faith. They're not walking in confidence. They've been living three days now since the resurrection, as though there's no resurrection. Now, one of them is named Cleophas. We don't know the name of the other. Could be a friend, could be his wife. But they've been with the apostles, and they've been with the Lord, the text tells us. If you take all the Gospels, they knew a lot about the Lord, and they believe in the Lord. They are believers. They just don't have a maturity and a depth to them yet. What does a lack of confidence in the Lord bring? One, it brings blindness. Would you write that in? It just brings blindness. If our confidence is not in the Lord, we have a blindness about us. We can't see what we need to see. You'll notice that Jesus is going to say Easter is the cure to blindness. You'll notice here that they have, a, they have a perspective about God that's wrong, and he's going to straighten it out for them. Now, I have a good friend named Reg. He, he's on his 14th eye surgery. I told you about my surgeries. He's doubled my surgeries. He's younger than me, fought in Afghanistan, led troops there, a godly man. I've helped him in his Bible classes. I mentor several young men that are in Bible seminary, and he'll have his next surgery here in the next week, and they just want to save his eyes, but he can see. Even if he loses his sight, which I hope he doesn't, he can see. He sees Christ. He sees his need for Christ. He sees his need to be a godly man in his home, to raise and disciple his children. He can see. These two people had saw Jesus for some period of time, probably about 18 months. The last 18 months of Jesus' life, he spent 75% of his time with the disciples. They've known him. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him heal lepers. They, they've seen all kinds of things, but they can't see what they really need to see. And so he's going to come alongside them. In verse 10 on your screen, it's interesting that Luke presents the first evangelist in the Bible, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and some other women. They see Christ's empty tomb, and they come back and tell the apostles, and the apostles don't believe them. The world has now been turned upside down. In Judaism, a woman wasn't allowed to give testimony in public court or the temple. If you were going to invent a religion, which this is not, it's a relationship, you would not have the women start out and the men locked behind doors hiding. That's where they are. In every religious book, everybody's pristine, everybody's perfect, but not in the Bible because none of us are that way. The men are behind locked doors. The women are out giving testimony. They said one, they said one thing, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Now, what happens immediately from here is that God is declaring what is always supposed to be men and women have equal value, but we have different roles. We have different roles, but equal value. For instance, a woman having a baby, that's a good thing. It would just take one man to have one baby, and the human race would die, and we just would die out. You're talking about a man cold. It just would end right there. It just wouldn't happen. Now, on the other side, I've told my wife, if I was mangled in an accident or decapitated, I bet there'd be one woman walk by and say, well, at least he didn't have a baby. That, I think that that's true, too. But these men are riding, and they say, 
we were upstairs hiding. We were upstairs behind a locked door. It was the women who went out public. You wouldn't start out if you, if you were going to make this up. That's not the way you do it. It shows you how real the Bible is. And by the way, your Bible that you hold in your hands, 99% of it is covered with manuscripts, over 10,000 manuscripts. The 1% that isn't covered has no major doctrine in it. No book in the world has the amount of manuscripts that your book has. Since the Dead, Scre Dead Sea Scrolls came along, which are so precise, people thought they were made up, which they're not now. They've been dated 100 and 200 years before Christ. We have the whole book of Isaiah, which said he'd be born of a virgin. He'd die on a cross, even before the cross was invented, and he would raise from the dead. This is a book about faith, about confidence, not a fairy tale. It's about the evidence of a historical Jesus who lived, who died, who rose again. That's why we're here today. So the women go out and they tell about Jesus. And verse 11 says, but the words seem to the apostles like a fairy tale. And they did not believe them. Their vision is blocked. They wanted what they wanted. And it didn't come true. I was just reading a story about a woman who went to the eye doctor and the doctor opened up her eyelid and she said, he said, you've got something in your eyelid. And he began to pull the contacts lens out and he pulled another out and he pulled another and he pulled 27 contact lenses out. 27. When I used to use contacts, I couldn't get one in my eye. I was, I was fiddling around all the time. I had to have my eye wide open. I had to have a mirror. I don't know how in the world you get 27. But he said to her, You'll never be able to see with your eye covered. The Bible says our eyes are covered till God sets our heart open, till he sets us free. They have some problems with their vision. Verse 12, Peter gets up and he runs to the tomb. Why is he running? Because he's the one who denied the Lord. You remember three times he denied the Lord. He wouldn't even use Jesus' name. He said, I don't know that man. He wouldn't even use his name. He said, I don't know that man. And so now he's running, and he runs to the tomb, and he looks in, he gazes, he sees. He sees the linen cloths laying there, folded up. He begins to wonder, who took him? If the Romans took him, they'd bring him out in a wheelbarrow. If the Jewish leaders took him, they would put him on a wall and say, it's done, it's over. They know they didn't take him. And, th and these people are going to die very bad deaths. One's going to be filleted. James is thrown off the temple 300 feet. One's boiled in oil. Peter's crucified upside down. Liars don't die that kind of death. He wonders who, who took him, what, what happened to him. And then the story jumps to verse 15. These two people on your screen or in your Bible, it says, while they were talking, Jesus drew near and he went with them, but he kept from recognizing him. That word kept means preserved like uh, jelly. He preserved them the way they were so he could walk with them. But he comes to them, and he walks with them. And he says to them, what have you been talking about? And they're going to say to him, are you the only person around here who doesn't know what's going on? Second, discouragement. Would you say discouragement with me? Just say it, discouragement. It's one of the number one problems in America and in the world today. Anxiety, discouragement, anger, it's a way of life. It's a way of life for many people. Discouragement means you've lost your confidence, enthusiasm, motivation. Paul Tripp reminds us this. If we think our worst problem is outside of us, we've got a big problem. It's inside of us. And so he comes to them, and they're discouraged. And if you just summarize 17 through 20, he walks with them. He says, what are you talking about? He says, tell me what's been going on. They said, we, we're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. He did great things and mighty things. Are you the only one around here that did not hear? He was delivered up and condemned and put to death. You may remember he was brought on charge for two major offenses that he claimed to be God. And they said he said he would destroy the temple, which was a lie. But they come to him and he's with them and he says, what's been going on? Verse 21 on your screen, we had hoped. We had hoped that he would redeem Israel. You see that? We had hope, but, he's, but our bubble's been busted. We're discouraged. 
we're dizzy, we're wobbly, we're not sure what to do. You may have went to the Dayton uh, Dragons, I love that name, the Dayton Dragons, you may have seen the baseball, they every once in a while have people come out and you get a baseball bat, right, and you put your forehead on it, I can't do that, I have vertigo, so they kill me, but you, you put your head on that bat, you go around and around and around, anybody ever seen that? Just one person say yes, okay, all right. Maybe I was imagining it. So you go around and around, and then you try your best to go to first base, and you can't. That's what it means. They're dizzy, wobbly, discouraged. We thought he was going to do this. We thought he was going to make this happen. We thought he was going to make Israel great. We don't know now. We're unsure. And he's speaking to them, and they don't know who he is yet. And he says, uh, I, you're going to have to tell me more. And he begins to listen to them as they walk on the road. When, when my stepmother gave me a book, I, it was the first book that I can ever remember reading the whole book that I didn't have to. It was called The Screwtape Letters. That's Lewis. She gave me a book because she wanted me to be a believer in Christ Jesus. She saw the way I was living. She knew I wouldn't probably read a Bible. So she gave me this book. And it's a demon talking to an older demon. And C.S. Lewis has written it to say what's going on behind the scenes. And so they're having a yard sale, and they're selling off things. And the whole premise of that chapter is some things don't work as well in different times and different periods. And so there's this thing in the back, and one of the demons says, what about this? Should I get rid of this? And the demon, the older demon, turns and says, no. That's discouragement. We never get rid of discouragement. If porn won't work, if lust won't work, if anger won't work, if gossip won't work, if prejudice won't work, discouragement always works. And here's what he says in the book. All the same, and this is a demon talking about God being the enemy. It is the enemy's invention, not ours, to have real pleasure. So far, we've not been able to produce one. All we can do is encourage humans to take pleasures in which the enemy has produced in a time or a way or a degree which he has forbidden. Over time, they will become discouraged and broken because a moderated religion is as good for us as no faith at all, and it's much more amusing. If we can just keep them religious and not walking with him and not walking close to him, they'll get discouraged in their religion, and it will be amusing to us. These two people are walking back, and the Lord wants to correct some of the things they grew up with. Now, where I was, last 25 years, Lake Erie, people did this crazy thing called ice fishing. They, they go out on the lake, and they build this hut, and they start a fire on top of the ice, and they drill a hole, and they fish. You may you may go ice fishing. Yeah, two people. Bless your hearts. They they go they freezing cold, and they catch fish, and they bring it out, and they tell you it's great while the fire's in there and the hut's in there. But every year, every year, somebody falls through in some way, some fashion. A year and a half ago, a person drowned. Not sure what they were doing out on the ice, but they didn't make it. Here's what they thought. They thought the ice was thicker than it was. In other words, they had sincerity and faith, but your faith is only as good as the object in which you have faith. So these two are walking back, and the Lord comes up beside them, and he's really saying, in essence, what's your problem? What's the challenge? What's going on in your heart? And they say, here's the things we hoped for, and it didn't happen. And what he's going to say to them is they have a heart problem. Psalm 55, 22, cast your cares on the Lord. Oh, Proverbs 13, 12. Let me do that first. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred, past due, makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Their heart is, is deferred, so they're sick. Now I'll put Psalm 55, 22. Cast your cares on the Lord. He'll sustain you. He'll never let the righteous be shaken. It means violently shaken or blown away. He'll never let you be violently shaken or blown away. And so though these two people don't believe, and though they're 
having struggles in their life, he comes alongside them and he walks beside them and he's telling them the best thing you can do right now is fall through the ice with your religion and what you grew up with. Best thing that could happen. Fall through the ice with that and trust me and believe and he speaks life into them. I'm going to bring a young lady up named Evelyn. I decided to switch it a little bit, so I didn't tell her, so I apologize. Evelyn's going to come up, and would you welcome Evelyn as she comes up here this morning? Would you give her a round of applause? I met Evelyn a couple of weeks ago. Uh, well, actually, when I came in February, I met her and just got to say hi to her, and she was just recovering from surgery, and then met her at the restaurant. And then I asked her, would she sometime uh, just share a testimony? And she said, yes. So welcome, Evelyn. Thank you. Tell us a little about yourself and how you came to know Christ. Well, at 11 years old, I was saved in a little church in Kentucky. And my life kind of moved along. Hmm. And um, of course, I didn't always live the way I should. And I, I, but the Lord was always with me, never left me. Hmm. Even when I tried works, hmm. I tried to work my way into heaven, and guess what? Hmm. It doesn't work. Hmm. So I go along then, and I find grace is what Jeff says there. Hmm. It's just by the grace of God. You can't do anything. Amen. 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 Then well, tell us some changes. What did grace produce in your life? Yeah. Well, um, I, I don't know if I, you always see what grace does, but God always takes care of us. Mm. He always moves. Uh, you sometimes we don't even know mm. um, what our life has, how our life has reflected mm. to other people. But the Lord always knows. He takes care of us. One of the things that you know, I've come to know about you as you went through a couple of discouraging times like, like these people did, and God's grace got you through it. You want to tell about one or two of those? I will. Uh, several years ago, I went through a very painful, painful divorce for me, for my children. But uh, I remembered reading before that time that uh, bitterness is like acid in a clay vessel. Hmm. It just eats away inside. Hmm. I knew I didn't want to be bitter. And you know what the Lord did? When the Lord took away the bitterness, he took away the feeling. Hmm. Hmm. It was just wonderful. Hmm. I just, I, I can't, I can't express how wonderful it was that he took the feeling away and I could look at my ex-husband, and he was just another person. It's amazing what God does. That's what we read earlier. We're not captured or captive to it anymore. That's right. Yeah. Then you had a, a pretty major surgery recently. I did. Last year, um, <clears throat> I uh, had a very bad infection in my foot. And um, I went along last year. I was in... Uh, the hospital several months. I uh, went into a sepsis and uh, nearly died, but but uh, the Lord saved me some, for some reason. I'm not sure. Hmm. But uh, at any rate, I um, go along, and in September, they tried all summer long, but in September, they amputated my foot and part of my leg. And um, during that time, I, I but I felt at peace. I, I didn't want to, mm -hmm. you know, I felt really at peace during this time. And um, after my amputation, my son, my youngest son, contracted pneumonia and then uh, COVID and was in the hospital while I'm recovering from being mm -hmm. my leg amputated. He was in the hospital for about a, a month and a half and he nearly died. But I, all I could do is talk to the people 
you that I know and love. You, you can't imagine what a loving, loving church this is. Mm. And they, they immediately talk to other people in other churches, and they started praying. And my son uh, survived. And I told him, you know how mothers do. Mm. I told him, I said, God has a plan for you. Mm. I don't know what it is. But he does. Mm. But while I was in the hospital, I had the most loving people around me. No one, my loved ones couldn't come to see me because of the pandemic. And, but I had the most loving people. The night that I heard, my, my daughter-in-law called and said that my son may pass away. He may not live. I had the most loving, loving nurse come in, and she prayed with me. Mm. That was wonderful. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you said that hospital room actually became a place of the gospel. It did. The good news. It really did because people came in and out, and I was just able to just love on them, and they loved on me. Mm. Mm. And then after my, while I was in the hospital, my daughter, who was not a carpenter, by the way decided she was going to tear out our master bathroom and redo it so that I could move around easily. Well, she had it almost torn out when I came home. And the day after I came home, she was working so hard, by the way. And the day after I came home, uh, Dale McLeod, who was pastor at the time here, he came over in his very calm voice. He said, Julie, I think I can come and pray for you. And he did. We got so many of these men. If I start naming them, I'll forget someone. But he got so many of these men here in the church, and they just lovingly came over and ripped out the hmm. bathroom and started rebuilding. And uh, Dale... He was the builder. He was the, uh, what do you call it? An overseer? Yeah. yeah. No, Chuck Frog was the overseer. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to mention Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Dale wanted to be the overseer? No. <laughs> no, no. If you ever work for Chuck, you're going to get the job done. Quickly. He is a mover. Mm. But at any rate, it, Dale, uh, mm. he was doing the, the woodwork. You know, he was building the, the walls. That was his job at the time. And uh, they all went to my daughter, Julie, because she had, uh, she had made up the plans. Well, uh, Julie looked at the, the door to the closet, and it was off by several inches. So she said, Pastor Dale, that, that's off. And he said, do you think anybody will really notice? <laughs> <laughs> so they had a very good time. I could hear them back there laughing, and Julie and Chuck would get into a friendly argument, and the next thing you know, they'd be laughing and laughing. They mm. had a really good time, and mm. I had a most beautiful bathroom with hand handrails everywhere so that I can get around easily. Mm. Mm. Evelyn, one of the things we wanted to say to you publicly is, we see Christ in you, oh, and I we love so. you. Yes, I hope so. Would you, yeah. Would you thank Evelyn this morning? And Jeff, could you come walk Evelyn? Would you walk Evelyn back? <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I do want to say how, what a loving church we have. If you want to find love, it's here. Mm. We never, after I came home from the hospital, not a day did we go without a meal. Mm. Someone brought us a meal every day. Mm. It's a loving church. I love mm -hmm. you all. Thank you, Evelyn. Mm -hmm. Third, they were living like practical atheists. What's how sad this is that they're living as though Jesus had not raised from the dead. Verse 21, we hoped that he would do these things. He hoped he'd redeem Israel. Besides this, it's now the third day. I got to think as I was going over this account this week, how many days, hours, weeks would I want to live as though there's no resurrection? 
they've lived way too long these three days. But all of a sudden, these discouraged men down and out, he, he has their story turn around like he turned my story around when I was 22. He turned some of your stories around. So here's as we finish this Easter, what happens when we live with confidence in God? One is we live in his promises. If you'll write that in, we can live by his promises. Not by the things that are going, like Evelyn said, not by what's happening. There was no way she could be with her son. She couldn't be there with her son. She had to trust God's promises. She had to ask people to pray. She said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. Now, here's why this is valuable. Nobody can live with confidence unless they know who God is and what he thinks about them and says about them and feels about them. You cannot live with confidence without that. They're talking too much to themselves. They're listening too much to themselves. And so he comes along, and in verse 25, he says to them, O oh, foolish ones, slow of heart, you should believe all the prophets have spoken. He says you've got two problems. You're acting foolish, and you're dull at heart. You've not accepted all the promises. A friend told me recently, he was on vacation, and they were there for a week, and he asked his wife, he said, I wonder how much it is to pay to go out on the, the boat. And she looked at him funny, and she said, honey, it's all inclusive. We can go anytime we want to on the boat. He lived all week there, not eating some of the things, not going some of the places. That's a terrible feeling. But to live as though there's no resurrection, to live as though there's no resurrection life, that's the worst thing of all. And so he tells them, Verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted all the scripture concerning himself. That's a Bible study. Jesus took them through the whole Old Testament, and he said, here's all the promises about me. They became the two best Bible scholars in the world, and they got closer to Christ. Now, he could have jumped out. He could have showed his nail-scarred hand, jumped off the temple. But he said he takes them through the Bible and he shows them who he is from Scripture. I want to give you three great promises this Easter. Romans 10, we're going to say them out loud together. You ready? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It means rescued and restored. I don't know your issues. I don't know your stuff. I know I got issues. Rescue you and restore you if you call on the name of the Lord. It means who he is and what he can do. His name is who he is and what he can do. Here's the second promise for this Easter. You ready? Jesus said, I've come that you might have life to the fullest. He doesn't do anything halfway. Satan told me, if you've become a follower of Christ, he'll ruin your life. He'll send you to Africa. You'll have to eat bugs. You know, all your fun will be gone. It was the exact opposite. 37 years, ups and downs, but I, it, is, it is the best life you can live, to live with your creator and your redeemer. He doesn't do anything halfway. The world can never produce what God can produce, ever. Here's one more promise. You ready? The joy of the Lord will be your strength. Jesus didn't say, I'll give you joy. He said, I'll give you my joy. The joy I had when I created these stars. The joy I had when I created life. The joy I have with the Father and the Spirit. He said, I'll blow your socks off with joy. I'll give you a joy that only comes from me. He told them how foolish they were to not walk in God's promises. Second, they could live in God's power. They could live in God's promises, but they could also live in God's power. Verse 26, is it not necessary, he said, that Christ, that Christ should suffer and die for you and go into glory. It was necessary that he would take our place, but it was also necessary he would give us his spirit. He would die for us, but he'd put his spirit in us. John 16, 7 says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage I go away. I'll send the strengthener. Everywhere that's translated, the strengthener, I'll send the one who strengthens you to give you life. May I say something about the Holy Spirit real quick? The Holy Spirit won't make you weird. If you're weird before you come to Jesus, you'll be weird after for a while. But he does not come to make you weird. Acts 1.8, he said, I'll give you the Holy Spirit and you'll be my witnesses. 
you will witness of God's glory of what he's done in your life if the Holy Spirit is in you. You'll walk like Jesus. You'll worship him. The Holy Spirit will lead you to love the Lord and worship him. It's not a, he's not about making people weird. He's about causing you to worship and enjoy him. One of my first times at the grocery store, I learned a hard lesson. Juice is not juice because it says it's juice. It's either flavored or it's filled, right? You, you've got to pick up the juice. You've got to read the small print. And you read there, and it says 1% juice and 99% water. And I want to say you sit on the throne of lies. And I put it back, and I don't want anything to do with that. Now, here's the thing about today. You can walk out of here. Everybody can walk out of here, and you can be a little bit flavored with God, or you can be filled with him. Can be a whole lot of water in you, you know, little juice, or you can be filled with Him. But the Bible's very clear. You can't be filled with God and be filled with yourself. You can't be filled with God and be an egomaniac or be about yourself, exalting yourself. You can, you can be filled with God or you can be filled with yourself. A man challenged me 35 years ago. My day every day to say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Here I am, and I've been doing it ever since. I, I, during the day when I meet with you and talk with you and I meet with people, I, I'm constantly praying, Lord, give me words to say. Let me love this person with you. Fill me with your spirit. You can't be filled with the Lord and with yourself. They're talking too much to themselves. They're listening too much to themselves. He comes along and says, I'd rather have you listen to my promises than your own self, and I'd rather you be filled with me than yourself. Pretty simple. Third, he says they could have been filled with purpose, his purpose. Life has purpose. We're created to love God and love others and make a difference in life and other people's life. Mark Twain said there's two great days of life, the day you're born and the day you realize why you were born. These two people are realizing why they were born. And so they asked him to stay and eat, and their eyes get opened. And please see this, no pun intended, verse 32 on your screen. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn? Why, he talked with us on the road, and he opened us to the scriptures. Wasn't that good? Didn't he fill you with joy? Didn't the scriptures come alive? Our hearts burned, verse 34 and they started saying, it's in a continual tense, the Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. So here's their new purpose. Tell everybody by their life and their words at life that the Lord has risen. You notice they say to Peter indeed, because Jesus had promised, he said, Simon, after you fail, I'll restore you and I'll meet you back in Galilee. I'll be there when you get there. The man who had publicly swore, Edersheim says, he called heaven and earth down. It's a, Jewish, it's a Jewish oath. The man who stood up and said, I swear, may heaven and earth swallow me whole if I ever met this man. The Lord said, I'll restore you back to life and ministry. And he even is coming for someone like Simon. They're proclaiming the good news. Heard a man last week, inviting people to Stanford University, and he said, only the best can come here. In God's family, it's exactly the opposite. Jesus said, only the worst can come here. Only those who are broke, who failed, who've misstepped, rejected him, went their own way, only the worst can come here. He said, I'm going to be there for you and for Simon. 1 Peter 1.3, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. He says, you can go down the road of life with hope and confidence. Only you know if you're living that way, but you can. The Bible says you need to be born twice, not just physically, but spiritually. It means born a second time or born from heaven. It means, as Evelyn said, you can't do it on your own. There's no good deeds or works or rituals. That you come to him and say, Lord, by your grace, would you change me? Would you forgive me of my sins? 
would you take over my life and become the Lord of my life? Everyone Jesus called, he called publicly. He called them to go public and to be baptized, to go in and go in the grave of the water and say, I died to my old self. I'm not in control of my life anymore. To come up out of the water and say, I'm risen. I'm living with Christ Jesus. Have you ever publicly said, I'm not ashamed of Christ? Have you ever publicly you went public and said, I, I love the Lord. I, I want to follow him. Everyone he called, he called publicly. He said, tell everybody, Jesus Christ is my Lord. These two people had lived too long without God's confidence. He says, you can live in promises that are beyond what you can imagine, power that you don't have, and you can live for a purpose. No matter what your spouse is doing, or your children or grandchildren are doing, or your neighbor's doing, you can live for purpose. That when you meet him face to face, he will say two things to you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of your master. Now the real joy begins. The real joy begins. I pray you believe that. Father, as we bow our heads for a moment, we give you thanks for this Easter Sunday. Thank you that you are living hope through Christ. There's salvation in your name that you're the one who sets people free, people like us. Death has no grip on us. You broke every chain. Lord, thank you. Thank you for changing so many lives in this place. I pray that you would change someone else right here, right here where they sit, that he or she will call out to you and say, I need you. Save me. Take me. Change my life. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in his life, his death, his resurrection. I want to be his. And I want you to use me the rest of my life to show people who you are. Oh, Lord, thank you for whatever you do. And God's people said, amen. Let's sing together about that confidence, that living hope we can have.
We are a sent people, sent to make a difference in people's lives. And because he is risen, we can live for him wherever he sends us this week. Be sure and greet someone before you leave today. And don't forget, first-timers, remember your Chick-fil-A cards back at the top. Of